Hi, my name is Terry Pancook. In this segment, I'd like to discuss my favorite passion, which is looking at recalled endodontic cases. There's no greater way to learn about endodontics than to look at your results. Okay, let's review the case history. The patient is currently an 81-year-old male. I initially treated him in 2006, and he presented with a mandibular right second molar and he exhibited crack 2 syndrome and when transilluminated tooth revealed a distal buccal cusp fracture which you can see on this clinical photomicrograph. Removal of the restoration revealed a crown fracture coursing through the distal marginal ridge as um, the initial access was performed the crack could be traced one to two millimeters into the distal wall of the distal canal orifice. The dentin was also quite stained with the rested caries that did not stain with caries indicator dye. All root canal systems were clean in shape with direct line access. Treatment was performed with the classic shielder technique utilizing hand files, multiple recapitulations to develop the apical prep and copious amounts of irrigation. When the root canal system was obturated, one can see multiple apical ramifications filled. The tooth was immediately restored with a bonded composite resin. The tooth was then restored by his general dentist with a gold crown. When the patient returned eight years later with a need for treatment on an additional tooth, in a different quadrant, which gave me the opportunity to take a cone beam CT recall. I performed cone beam CT scans on any tooth I've treated uh, prior to five years. I try to get as many patients back as possible five years after treating the tooth for a free cone beam CT recall. The PA radiograph you can see shows uh, unremarkable findings with no 2D inference of a periapical radiolucency on either of the two roots that I treated. The adjacent first molar shows frication bone loss and, and shows a small periapical radiolucency about the mesial root. The clinical microphotograph you see here shows the nice gold crown restoration of the mandibular second molar and the porcelain fused to metal crown on the first molar with a very small occlusal outline. Very small occlusal outlines limit your ability to evacuate debris and irrigate cleaning the canal system thoroughly. Um, I'm going to go through the CT scans and discuss why I believe the current popularity of minimally invasive endodontics and the so-called ninja access have um, particular problems that really aren't obvious until you look at recalled cases in 3D and you understand the subtle nuances of perioendo disease and really the subtle symptoms a patient may have the rest of their life related to low-grade subclinical pathosis. So I'm going to start off by showing the 3D scan there. You can see that these two molars, the lower second molar that I had treated in 2006, um, you can note the periodontal bone levels are fairly normal. The periodontal bone level on the lower first molar, um, there is a furcation defect. Now the patient isn't having symptoms with the tooth, but there is some progressive periodontal bone loss and it's not quite exactly healed. Now I'm, I'll show you how I examine a tooth when I recall it when I very meticulously look at it in 3D. Right now I have all the planes intersecting at the apex of the mesial root of the lower second molar that I treated. I'm going to slide through it and you can look at it in the mesial distal plane as we slice through and the bone looks pretty good. You look at the apex, um, I'll use the mouse right here, the bone looks intact, there's no real periapical radiolucency. Um, the next thing I like to do is rotate around the axis of that root. I look for any lateral lesions or any problems and it helps you um, 
just see a, just a rotational view of the root, which is very helpful in examining the bone levels on recall. And again, things look fairly normal as you spin around the planes on the axis of that mesial root. Let's orient it fairly straight to where we started, right there. Okay, now let's travel up the transverse plane on that mesial root. Um, you can notice mesial root looks fairly normal. You can go up. There's not much of a mesial concavity, and there's where the pulp chamber merges. And you get some burnout with the metal. Let's go back down to the apex. And I actually like to go through the apex and go apically, kind of see if there's any radiolucency, and there isn't. It looks pretty good. I would say that the osseous tissues about the MB root, about the mesial root of the lower second molar, looks pretty well healed with normal attachment in all dimensions that we examined. Now, let's do the same thing for the distal root of that tooth. Now, as I slide through, I like to look at the furcation, which is right in the middle there, and I don't really see any radiolucency. The furcation looks fairly intact. Let's slide the planes through the center of the distal root. And at least in this plane, it looks pretty good and like we have intact bone. Now, one thing you may note about cone beam CT, you can look at fortuitous angles and slide planes where you might see normal bone, but if you slide a little bit further, you might find a radiolucency and you might not be seeing the entire, the entire picture. Let's rotate around that root. That one also looks pretty normal. Now, from this view, you can see the little sealer puff um, on the right lower panel, yeah, it looks like maybe there's a little radiolucency around that. That could be foreign body reaction, um, but I, I like to note that. Any area where bone hasn't grown back completely, I like to note. I'm not particularly worried about it. If the patient had symptoms, I would be worried about it. But I'd have to say as we spin around like a top around the distal root, that also looks fairly normal. Okay, now we're getting back to our original view here. Now, by contrast, let's look at the mandibular first molar. Start off, let's drag the transverse plane up so we're catching this apical portion of the mesial root. The transverse plane section you can see right here is very interesting. That gives you a good view whether the canals were filled symmetrically down the center of each root. Um, if you see any asymmetric um, positioning of uh, the radiopaque material, that might mean there's a missed canal or some additional anatomy that may not have been treated. Okay, as we go up into the furcation area, there is, it's not quite apparent that there's a radiolucency, but on this sagittal section, When you look on the lower sagittal section, toward the lingual, there is some bone loss in the furcation. It's, ra it's a radiolucent area. You can presume that radiolucency uh, indicates some incipient furcation bone loss. Now, there is a high frequency of furcation accessory canals. Um, they exist in the literature reported anywhere from 15 to 30 percent frequency. So, if the pulp chamber, if this tooth was treated without a rubber dam and the pulp chamber septic, it's not unlikely that there could be septic transmission through um, a furcation accessory canal, which could cause some slight furcation bone loss that may or may not be noticeable uh, with clinical symptoms. Okay, so let's go and approach the mesial root just like we did on the second molar. Right away, you can see there's a periapical radiolucency on this tooth. Okay, let's line it up. You can see it's a small radiolucency. Um, I would have to say that, you know, the canals 
are definitely a little weaker. They're not filled as densely at that area. And if they're not filled, you can also uh, sometimes presume, or suspect at least, that it probably wasn't cleaned or debrided because um, what you don't clean, you often can't fill. So you can see there's absent material in the mesial root and there's a resultant radiolucency, which you can presume is very likely a lesion of endodontic origin. Now let's slide through the plane back and forth like we did the other one and it's that's kind of the dimension that it's the largest. You can see that in the frontal plane here. There's the largest extent of that radiolucency, some bone loss. So some so we have some furcation bone loss for this case um, and a small um, area bone loss at the apex of the mesial root. Let's rotate it around. Let's rotate around this root like a top and we can see that it's pretty much a uniform radiolucency around the mesial root. There appears to be no lateral uh, radiolucencies along the root as we rotate around. And we'll bring it back. Now let's check out the distal root. Looks like there's a little bit of trouble on that one, too. Yep. So it's filled slightly short. Now we all know that obturation isn't as important as cleaning, but often obturation is a marker. Fill a, you often can't fill a space you haven't cleaned. So when somebody says filling isn't important, they you also have to believe that they probably don't think that cleaning isn't very important either. So let's go. So there's definitely. So you notice on the upper left transverse section when you go towards the apex you see two dark uh, radiolucencies at the end of the root. So the bone hasn't quite healed there, which one can presume is a small titer of bacteria causing inflammation and resulting in a failure of complete osseous regeneration in that area. So there is bone loss um, at the apex of the distal root and the mesial root of that lower first molar. And it looks well filled coronally, but the apical third is, is the important area. That's the area that communicates with the uh, periodontal tissues. And it wasn't addressed completely. Uh, even though the patient doesn't have symptoms, this is an area which could be future problem for the patient. Maybe not, but it's not very elegant treatment. It's not treating a tooth with endodontics the best way that it can be treated. I'm much happier with the result of the lower second molar than I am the lower first molar. Now it's very interesting these days, with the advent of cone beam CT, this sheds a light on everybody's work. Uh, I've looked at 650 uninterrupted sequential recalls since I first got my cone beam CT machine in 2009 and of those 650 cases um, I've been able to get about 350 cone beam um, CTs and it's very interesting. Uh, I know why my cases fail and it's usually an inability to find root canal anatomy, clean it properly and fill it. So I think it's very disingenuous for people to now be wanting to redefine success and say that it's okay because they're finding all these radiolucencies at the apices of roots they've treated. Well, just because the patient's asymptomatic doesn't mean there isn't still disease and there isn't the potential for this to be a problem later on. It's not the best treatment we can provide for the patient. It's not eliminating disease and it's not good endodontics. And so I don't think we should redefine success and popularize a new endodontic technique based upon restorative-driven cosmetic dentistry. Elimination of the disease substrate is the essential goal of endodontics and the foundation for restorative dentistry.